Welcome back to the Flex Diet Podcast. <clears throat> I'm your host, Dr. Mike T. Nelson. And on this podcast, we talk about all things to enhance your performance, improve body composition, and do it all without destroying your health in a flexible process to start. And today on the podcast, I've got Ian Mitchell from Wizard Science, and he also runs a whole ton of other companies. And I will warn you that we go right into it at the start with a discussion heavy into physics and a bunch of other stuff that sounds very But what I love about Ian is that he is constantly testing things. And I've seen him change his opinion based on actual data. So I know the conversation sounds a little bit, but I always enjoy talking to people who are definitely on the edge, but appear to be getting results. A friend of mine told me years ago to look for the weirdos that are getting results. Maybe they're onto something. And again, doesn't mean that they're always right, but in a few years, a few months, we'll have more data and maybe they are correct. But either way, super fascinating discussion. I had a great time talking to him. I want to give a big thanks to my buddy Ben Pakulski is where I first heard Ian on. And I talk about this in the podcast, but I sent Ben a text and I'm like, is this guy completely full of crap or is he like a legitimate genius? And Ben texted me back. He said, no, I think he's a legitimate genius for sure. It's like, ah, interesting. Big thanks to Ian for his time here. And in terms of product placement or anything like that, we do have a discount for you. However, it's not an affiliate link. I don't make any any darn money off of it. Go to wizardscience.com forward slash discount forward slash Nelson, N-E-L-S-O-N. <clears throat> That'll save you 15% off a one-time purchase. We do talk about some of the sports supplements he has there at the very end. And what I would love to do is have this be a way for you to test it out at a discount and let me know what you find. I'm gonna be doing this coming up. By the time this goes out, I've already started for a few days. So I'll report back in the future on the newsletter with what I find. But I would love for you guys to, to test it out. Give me a ring, let me know what you find, yay or nay. I will say I have purchased some of his other supplements, which were helpful, was definitely helpful for my wife. Tried it out on a couple clients and results were a little bit mixed. But again, could be something going on with their physiology that was different with mine also. So go to wizardscience.com forward slash discount forward slash <coughs> Nelson, discount Nelson. And we'll put a link in uh, the show notes and everything here for you. Again, it's not even an affiliate link. I actually turned down any affiliate commission. So I wanted to try to stay as impartial as possible, give you guys a discount, and I would love to hear about your data. If you want to hear more about experiments and everything I'm doing, go to www.miketnelson.com. Get onto the newsletter, which is entirely free, and that's where I send most of my content. So things I'm working on, tips that have been useful for clients, all things to increase your performance, add muscle, and get better body composition in a flexible approach. So enjoy this wide ranging and out there conversation at times with Ian Mitchell of Wizard Sciences. We haven't met before, so kind of give me the rundown. What sorts of stuff do you do? I know you're a doctor, obviously. So yeah, give me the rundown. Um, yeah, I did a PhD in exercise physiology and metabolism, looking at the concept of metabolic flexibility and heart rate variability. The, the fancy title was fine scale variability across physiologic systems, right? So looking at every system we've looked at, if we look fine enough, we see that normal has a little bit of oscillation whether that's breathing weight, sway, heart rate. So we were trying to extend that concept to metabolism. If we yeah. look at RER, basically the ratio of fats to carbohydrates during steady state exercise, it'll move around a little bit at steady state. And we saw in a pilot data, some overweight people, it did not move around much at all. So our hypothesis was 
Could we do variability analysis of that RER and use that to differentiate a metabolically healthy versus unhealthy population without having to do insulin clamp study or pull a lot of bloods or even high intensity exercise? This is all 30 or 60% of ET. Wow, that's actually, and so I take it, it all proved out that definitively there is a correlation that you could draw data from that would support the hypothesis that is in fact the case yeah we have two two groups of pilot data that was published and then the study i did initially was step one do a gauge r and r is this method even repeatable if you have different observers you've got your protocol and so what i showed was uh, yeah it is and then i left finished my phd published a study on energy drinks another one on heart rate variability and then when you do an advanced degree like kind of some of the stuff you've done in your own head you're like this is amazing. Someone else is going to find this research and they're going to show that it definitely happens. And now no one gives a shit. Like no, to this day, nobody even cares. So no one's ran the experiment of, Oh my God. Does it actually mean anything or not? I don't know. I think so, but. Oh my God. That is dude. You're, you are preaching to the choir, Mike. That is so true, man. There's some things like when you hit it, you're like, ah, you're making right. yeah. Archimedes moment. You're like, ah, this is amazing crickets total crickets yeah. yeah yeah and i'm like hey I man mean, if i'm wrong cool just run the experiment and show me that i'm wrong i don't have any problem with that but it's no one's like Meh. <laughs> yeah it's actually it's funny a lot of the quantum biology stuff that i've been doing i think it's because it's still somewhat fringe actually not somewhat fringe it's very decidedly fringe that it's difficult to grapple with because it takes where we currently are and it's almost it's pushing it a little farther and then having to make a couple of jumps in logic and extrapolation to actually arrive at what's most likely happening they even come up with a really concrete hypothesis about how these things are functioning i can get the data sets i can make repeatable data sets anybody else could do the experiment i could show them how to structure it i have no doubt that they would get the same data sets but i just think it's going to fall on deaf ears because it's such a jump in logic from where we are in the very you know, macro scale molecular world to say, yeah, this is great and all, but it actually really has to do with vibrations, but not vibrations in a spectra or a spectrum that, that we can actually assess yet because we're meaty creatures and we're too solid to actually be that granular and see what's really affecting what we really are. And it's just, it's a bitch because everything is structured around the idea that the universe is like a big machine when I was telling a friend of mine, Luke's story, the same thing. And I said, it, it's very much obvious that we are more a thought than a thing. Mm -hmm. I, based on the data that I've been, been doing, actually generating experimental data that's repeatable that anybody could do. And I've been doing it in a double blinded fashion with a professor that I work with where I used to teach. And uh, then the guys from Lilo Quantum were showing all sorts of bizarre facts that are only bizarre because the constructs that we've been approaching them with, which is everything is a material thing first. Actually, it seems that it's really not. It hmm. seems like things are conscious first, and then physicality is the epiphenomenon of consciousness, not the other way around. And oh. I think for probably the majority of the time, people will say, oh, you know, you have a body, your body has a heart, and you have a brain, and your brain produces thoughts, and then that gives us an awareness, and it's our complicated thought process and the neural potentiation and firing that does this in a complicated network. I don't actually think that's the case. I'm actually, at this point, completely in the camp of we have a consciousness, and the consciousness produces a coalesced form of vibrations around that basis that aggregates to form a physical presence and hmm. then thing, things derived from that. And if you think about it, it explains, no pun intended, so many things. The effect of placebo, if you propagate a vibration and you're thinking about something and your consciousness is pushing something in one direction, the aggregate of that ripple could have tangible effects, right? There's an electrochemical potentiation typically in a thought, right? And if not electrochemical, there's definitively an electrical potentiation every time there's a thought. Just basic physics, we know that creates a ripple, right? There's an electromagnetic pulse. If that pulse is actually the thing that really has fundamental bearing on the reality in which we're occupying space, then it's possible that it elicits some sort of tangible behavior. And that's with a lot of the quantum biological effects. That's what we're seeing is that thoughts affect things. It's like the double slit experiment, right? Why yeah, explain would it be that because I've looked at that and 
<laughs> the first couple of times someone told me about it, I was like, yeah, whatever. And then the more I looked into it, I was like, I, I don't know. <laughs> so how would the act of observation affect the outcome of something going from basically a, a principle of a quantum state, right, to be a Rodinger or something like that, where it's occupying both spaces at once and then suddenly collapsing the waveform and becoming a definitive particle. That only can really happen if the two things are intrinsically related, right? It's not going to happen if they're objectively separated. It's only going to happen if they're subjectively related. And I think that's why that experiment is so perplexing is because if you think of it in the sense of we're physical creatures first and waveforms second, it doesn't make any sense, right? If you think of everything as collected or collective of vibratory functions, it starts to make sense. So for people who don't know the concept, basically, if you have something and you fire particles, be it photons or electrons, through two slits, if they're a waveform, they propagate differently and there's carryover of the waveform and it moves as a wave. But the moment the experiment is observed, those waveforms collapse and they act as if a particle. So the wave particle duality is basically proven out that yes, light can in fact be both things, but it, it collapses upon observation. And if you think about, are you familiar with the 2022 Nobel Prize in Physics for proving Bell's theorem? No. Kind of the, basically, the idea was Einstein had this thing. He and Niels Bohr used to have this argument about a spooky action at a distance is what yes. Einstein called it. <clears throat> and Einstein didn't buy it, didn't think it could happen. But in, in fact, <clears throat> excuse me, it does happen. But he was wrong in the sense that it's not two objects remotely being thing and being entangled. What happens is once they become entangled, they actually become one waveform. So despite the fact that they're two objects from our perspective, they in fact act as if they're one waveform. Hmm. And so when you pick up one end of the stick, it doesn't matter whether the other end of the stick is a foot away from you or on the other side of the universe. <clears throat> it's still one collected waveform. Yeah, that's the part I think that trips me out is because as humans, we think of distance has to have some sort of factor to it. The fact that these two things are maybe next mm -hmm. to each other, yeah, I can buy that they're probably related to each other. They're 5,000 miles apart and they're both right. doing the same thing. It's, oh. it's. I think one of the other things is, I don't know, there, there are a lot of constructs that based on that data being very definitively proven, and based on the experiments that I've been doing with quantum biology lately, I'm beginning to even wonder whether distance is really what we perceive it to be, whether it's actually really as impactful, because the idea of even waveforms propagating across one side of the universe to the other instantaneously, because they just have actually in the past couple of years clocked using femtosecond pulse lasers, they've actually clocked the speed of said entanglement. And it was at a minimum over a hundred thousand times faster than the speed of light. Now, oh. yeah, yeah, that's pretty damn quick. Yeah, it's faster than I can make it through downtown Austin traffic right now. For all intents and purposes, it's simultaneity, right? It's instantaneous transmission of information, and that kind of begs the question: as a human, are we even looking at? the right thing? Are we asking the right questions? And I think to a certain extent, more likely than not, we probably are. It's so far, like you just said, it's so far removed as a person when you're observing these things and you start to drill down into the granularity of it. It doesn't make sense. Logically, you can't cognize, oh, I can do this here and do it there all at the same time. It's difficult to grapple with the whole adage of you can't be two places at once you probably can in fact hmm. be two places at once if you pumped enough energy through the waveform that is a person why not what's to say that you can't in fact be two places at once it's just our concept of what is obvious on macroscopic behavior is so detached from what is relevant in quantum behavior that it's an entirely different set of rules that you're playing by it's just, I think that's actually what I like about it is the science is undecided as of yet in terms of biological effects of quantum behavior. So it's not just having to memorize things and learn things by rote. We actually have to think 
and really scratch our heads and puzzle. I think actually quantum biology is in the same position that quantum physics was 100 years ago, right? We really have to start rewriting the rules of, yes, we are a hot, kind of squishy, wet system, but what does that actually mean? For the longest time, we only thought quantum behavior would exist with the things that were at absolute zero and under very special states and differing states of matter that were the exotic states. And now it turns out it's happening all the time inside our own brain. It's there, there are bits of our neural processing where things aren't very much moving in, in quantum behaviors. And it's just fun for me to grapple with that. Your brain is basically a quantum computer. Who knew? Do you think the negative of that, and I know I'm guilty of this too, like when someone starts talking about quantum physics, it's very easy for my eyes to glaze over because I've tried to look at it. I have just have this barely just a little bit of a grasp of it that sometimes it feels like it's almost like smoke and mirrors of, oh, trust me, this is quantum based whatever widget 465 is. I don't know. I have a hard time wrapping my head around that without at least any experimental data to say, how do you know? How did you test it? What did you do? (laughs) Yeah, actually, it's funny that you say that. That's one of my things is that's why I've been doing all these double-blinded studies is because for my role as the the scientific advisor for Lila Quantum, it's great to say that it's, it's quantum. But most times when I hear people say that, oh, it's, it's imbued with quantum this or that. Right. My, my bullshit meter goes off and I'm like, yeah, yeah. sorry, no. <laughs> and you're with, I just, I don't buy it. Intrinsically, I think that the term quantum is used for a lot of smoke and mirror stuff because people don't generally grasp it. They can't handle the math behind it. If somebody's not going to bust out Schrodinger's equation and understand it, like they're not really going to grasp what's actually happening for the most part. So I think a lot of times marketing people use that and just run with it. But if you do the if you do the work and you do the experiments and you can prove it to me, aces. The guys at Lila Quantum, that was one of the things I really appreciated is they were definitively showing biological effects. And so I wanted to do the same thing in terms of, okay, how can we do a double blind with this and show cellular effects at a distance? How can we show that we're entangling these things? How can we and so that's been fun to to play with, but I was on a call with a company that's doing quantum stuff and said, that's great and all, but we need to do brain scans to prove the behavior out. Mm -hmm. This is in fact the case and you are listening this behavior, then we can either put up or shut up. If I'm going to get on board, we have to verify it and say that, yes, this is true. We can prove it in a repeatable double blind fashion that this is what's going on. And I think that's one of the things that's generally missing is like, how do you do that? And with, I always joke that we don't have a quantumometer yet because in terms of the scale, the best kind of thing that you're going to find is I've got a lot of spectroscopy equipment, HPLCs, GCMS, LCMS, all, all this mass spec kind of stuff. And really all that tells us at this point in where we are in the sciences, is this thing something that we recognize, right? What is this in terms of compositional structure? So this molecule is this molecule. As it turns out, and I know this because I've seen the differentiation in terms of the results of different experiments that we've done, just because something is in effect the same molecule, it doesn't mean that it exhibits the same molecular behavior. And I did this experiment on stage at the biohacking conference in 2021, and you can find it, it's on YouTube, where the, uh, the guys at Leela asked me if I could do something that was demonstrable on stage so people could see that we were eliciting a shift in quantum function. And so what I came up with was I took someone that had a really horrible shellfish allergy and brought them on stage and I derma rolled one of their arms and then I opened a can of crab and took the juice and rubbed it on their arm and their arm instantly swelled up. They had a histamine reaction, the welds, which is effectively the old school dermal stamp test that everybody's used to. Yep. And so then I put the crab meat in the quantum block and I talked about quantum behavior a little bit and waveform dynamics and asked people to imagine a wave. And everybody, of course, thinks of something like that. But really, that's a very basic assessment of it. It's actually, if you really want to think of a wave as more like spheres that are oscillating and undulating, that also have chirality and a pressure gradient. And there's probably 18 different things that I could prattle off that are very defining 
and important characteristics if you're going to quantify a waveform. And so what's really going on with changing the quantum behavior of something is you manipulate some of those effects and then they cascade up from a waveform to become a particle. So after I finish blathering on about waveforms, most of which I think people probably glossed over on, like you were saying, I took the crab meat out and then I derma rolled his other arm and put the crab juice in and nothing happened. And that was perplexing to people, <clears throat> but it was in real time. And everyone in the audience walked up to look at his arms because it was demonstrable. You could see that something was different. In one segment, same can, same person, one arm is having a reaction, one arm is not having a reaction. And the only difference was three minutes inside a quantum block. It's because if you think of us as a waveform, an aggregated waveform, then we're not really primarily molecular interactions, we're waveform dynamics. And so when you change the waveform, what you're looking for is constructive or destructive interference, which actually any musician or anyone who's ever heard somebody tuning a guitar <clears throat> has been around something when it's moving in and out of phase and you hear beats, those are nodal interaction points. And what's really going on there is as you tune it up, you get things moving in concert and that b becomes a constructive interference where there's not that dissonance that most people would find distasteful. It's a pleasant chordal sound where two tones are commingling. And so if, in the case of the crab meat, he had some problem with that at a subtle level. So if you put it in a quantum block and you negate that detrimental effect where you have destructive interference, the outcropping of which is a histamine reaction, then you suddenly negate that. Now, from a molecular standpoint, the crab was the crab. It didn't change. But from a subtle standpoint, it was different. So if I looked at that in terms of spectroscopic analysis, what I can definitively say as a scientist is, yes, the mass spec is the exact same. I will tell you that the molecules are the same. The box is blue. But the contents of the box are obviously different because in a matter of minutes, it created a different result. And every single time will continue to create a different result. And so that's not something that says these things are the same. It's obviously something that says these things are exhibiting disparate qualities, right? They're different. But from the standpoint that we're at in science currently, the molecule is the same, but obviously something else is going on. The vibration is different. And we could say that maybe the electron clouds are orbiting in a different capacity. Maybe it's fluctuating in a different capacity. Maybe the bond angles are changing. We don't really know. That's the problem is it's getting to such a degree of fine-tuned granularity that it's getting beyond the capacity that we currently have to look at things. And I think it's going to take a little while for <clears throat> the science to catch up with the experimental data that's coming in, which again, that's actually what I love about it is it's not all stuff that's just wrote where we can read the answer in a book and keep cruising. We really have to think and ponder and say, what's happening? This is not what I expected. Why is this the way this is? Could you partially explain part of that as a placebo effect or were you using verbiage to not try to predispose a certain result. I haven't watched it yet. I'll try to find a link to it. Yeah, I suppose you could say it's a placebo effect. Placebo it's still effect, a real effect I, though. Yeah, it's, it will, yeah, a placebo effect yields a tangible effect. It's not an effect, it's an effect. So it's, I'm not just causing the change. I'm actually changing the resultant data. So it, yeah, it doesn't really matter. Every time I do the experiment, I get the same outcome. That's what we base things on. <laughs> it's so it doesn't, it, I don't actually care what the causation is in that capacity. What I care about is what does the experimental data say? Where does it take me? What is the outcropping of that data? And every single time it's that something's different. Now to that end, and this brings up a good point, I think I may actually redo this. If I did that with say 10 or 20 people, and I didn't tell them what was happening, would the effect be different on their arm? I think actually I'm going to do that. Thank you for that. That's keen. Yeah. I think or, I'll redo the experiment. Or if you want to get crazy, could you do a nocebo effect? You're doing this. I'm like, hey, I'm going to go put it in this thing. I'm like, ah, I don't think this experiment's going to work. It fails all the time. And do you get a different result? I don't know. These are things that like 
partially keep yeah, me up at night. I think that's actually that's the thing, though. That's it, it, the, these are the kinds of things that should keep anybody who's being an honest scientist up at night is, you know, what what impact am I having on my own experiment? What impact is the environment having? Is it true? Now, one of the things that's interesting about that very question, though, is with the idea of a nocebo effect, how much of that is us changing our environment just by virtue of the observation or the thought constructs that we have? If, in fact, they are all waveforms, then every waveform that propagates, whether it's a subtle intention that you have that's inherent to the person you are or whether it's something you're actively expressing, all of those things would be qualities would have an impact on that interaction in that given environment, which which makes it really difficult because if everything is subjective, we're hosed in terms of the way we've been approaching science for quite a while. It's, it makes it much more difficult to get an objective to be. That, that, that's what's praised in science is, oh, it's completely objective. It's double blind, placebo controlled. Well, if everything in, is in fact tr- subjective by definition in nature, if we're running up the wrong hill. I don't know. I suppose time will prove it out. That's one of the beauty parts of this is <clears throat> we're learning as we go. And it's not a steadfast construct, which I, I really appreciate. I'd much rather be in a position where I'm the slow guy in the room and don't really know exactly what the right answer is. If I wanted to know what the right answer was, I'd probably teach kindergarten mathematics or something like that and right. be very happy. <laughs> but, you know, I actually, I far prefer the other. <laughs> where I really don't know. Do you think sometimes that the scientific process is obviously is going to be limited by time, money, constructs, experiments, but do you think a lot of times it's more limited by the questions that people ask? Some of the things I think about are, we never ran that experiment because everybody knows blah, blah, blah. And then you sometimes go back and look and you're like, I don't know. No one really ran an experiment on that. And sometimes they've run thousands of experiments, but sometimes I found stuff we just glossed over because it seems rather obvious, but that's kind of the point of science. If we knew all the answers already, we wouldn't be doing all these damn experiments. (laughs) Yeah, actually, I think there's a lot of fundamental things that we take for granted that completely throw us off. One one of my one of my favorite cartoons of all is it's a far side cartoon and I cite it. Sometimes I'll cite it during lectures because it really does see a lot of what we do in science is there are these two sharks that are swimming and one is looking up at the other and all these people are running up on the beach. And one one shark says to the other, dude, your dorsal fin is sticking up. How long do you think that's been screwing things up for us? It's the (laughs) non-obvious effect that we don't know what we don't know, right? It could be completely obvious, but we may be just entirely asking the wrong question. And that's very possible. But I actually think that's probably, to your point, very much happening a lot of the time. We're probably just asking the wrong questions. But that's the beauty part of it. If you said... A thousand years ago, if I asked somebody, what do you think it's going to be like in a thousand years? There's no way they could have conceptualized the things that we're doing now. It just wouldn't be possible. You wouldn't have the framework or the constructs to even begin to think about the things that we're doing now. No, nobody's going to say, you wouldn't have even thought to ask the question, what's the most popular app going to be? Yeah. <laughs> what's the biggest social network? The what? It's just... The things that we consistently take for granted don't even exist in a lot of cases for quite a while. It's statistics like that. I have four kids, so I look at things that are going to impact them in the future. And you see a lot of statistics saying 50% of the jobs that will exist in 15 years don't exist now. It's wow, that's the pace of change is really differentiating things in terms of where we are now versus where we'll be in the future. But we don't know the questions to ask. And that's a, it's literally something that isn't invented or hasn't been discovered or is just outside of the placement of where we really are. And that's, it's cool, but it's also a bit mm, tricky to deal with because it's an unknown quantity. How do you put a pen in that? You don't. That's the, I think that's the thing that's intriguing about science is you have to be really agnostic about the outcome because I was doing an experiment the other day. I was working on trying to use some quantum behaviors to negate the need for EDTA, heparin, sodium citrate, and things like that as coagulant agents. And you line like vessel tubes with that when you do blood collection and stuff you're talking about. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And so in, in the lab, I set up this experiment. We were doing this thing. 
failed miserably, did not work. And that's okay. The result of the data just said, I'm wrong. All right, fair enough. I'm wrong. I'll probably be wrong maybe 90 times out of 100. That's cool. If I can move the needle forward 10 times out of 100, great. I'm feeling really good about that. But I have to be agnostic about it. I can't be so wrapped around the axle about I'm right, I'm right, that that I conclude what I'm really seeing. That's that's why the it's not even just being agnostic. You have to be very brutally honest, I think, in science to say, okay, one, I don't care where the data takes me. I'll actually follow it. Two, I don't care if I look like an utter buffoon. I'm going to run down this path and see where it goes. And a lot of times I probably, I personally probably do look like a buffoon, but there's a lot of times when you see something, and I'm sure you've done this too, where you'll see something and go, how does that work? And it sends you down an entirely different pathway where the thought process is completely different than it would have been had you followed the normal course of events or had you had any ego attached to the idea of, I just gave a lecture on this, so I'm not going to say something that is in opposition to that because I want to seem right. I can tell you matter of factly, I have seen so many academicians that like when somebody's an academic they teach a certain thing and they teach it for a long time and they get tenured they don't want to turn around and say you know what turns out everything i've taught you for the past 30 (laughs) years is absolute bs we were completely wrong because it's a facing it's something that makes them have a check in their ego it dings them in their own perception of self you can't do that i think you have to be you know what If I look like a complete moron, so be it. I'll look like a complete moron. And I, it's funny, my dad, when I was a kid, my dad gave me this book that was called Enhancing Your Genius. Hmm. And it it was peculiar because the, the whole idea was what you can do to take the qualities that you have and to push it forward. And one of the things was to go into some place of work or business or social setting and make loud animal noises. And I, I did, I bopped into a Starbucks in Westlake in Austin and (laughs) and everyone was looking at me like, what is this jackass doing? (laughs) But the whole idea was to get past the idea of being attached to your ego and being worried about what other people thought about you. Because if you're going to truly be a genius, if you're going to push the bounds, if you're going to really be outside of the box, well, inside the box is safe and comfortable outside of the box, people will call you names and make fun of you and think you're a complete jackass sometimes. Okay, so what? You're going to break the egg making the omelet. That's just the case. And it's totally true because I remember when I was doing that, people do look at you and they obviously (laughs) very much cast judgment on you. Who is the jackass making the animal noises? Why is that guy in a Barnes and Noble making very loud animal sounds? And it was like, the Barnes and Noble attached to the Starbucks I went to almost every day by my house. And so it was a little, you know know what? (laughs) So it was actually socially like, and I chose that place specifically because it was going to create a little psychological pressure for me because I didn't want to do it in a vacuum where I didn't have anything to risk. I would most likely see some of these people again, and they would most likely go, yeah, that's the guy who makes animal noise. (laughs) But you just, you think if you're going to be honest and you're going to push the bounds and you're going to do science, that's what it takes is just check your ego at the door follow the truth, follow where the data takes you and brace yourself for impact because more likely than not, if you're doing your job at that, you'll catch some flack. I'm sure you, you probably had the same experience. Yeah. The thing I think of is years ago, I did a presentation for DARPA. So the defense advanced resource project agency. So for people listening, like they literally discovered technology that was the cell phone, the early ARPANET, the, what became the internet. So a lot of the military technology kind of filters down through everything else. And the two things I walked away from that remembering was one, I was by far the dumbest person in the room who no questions asked. These people were not only crazy smart, but like the questions they were asking, like every time I was like, oh, that's such a good question. I didn't think of that one at all. You know what I mean? They weren't, everyone was super nice and obviously you have to be vetted to get there and everything else, but just the level of thinking and questioning that they had and how open they were to really crazy stuff because the guy who did the first lecture is like all right we don't want any of this typical test this then do this like whack-a-mole nutrition physiology he's like we're trying to solve stuff that's 5 10 15 years away and i was like oh okay 
And then during the lunch break, I was asking one guy, I said, Hey man, so if you do get a contract from DARPA, like, how do you, like, how do you get your contract canceled? What's the list of stuff? Like you definitely don't want to do this or to screw up. And he's like, you want to make sure to show them all your failures. I'm like, wait a minute. Do they want to see all of your failures? He's like, yep. They'll can your ass if you don't show them enough failure. And I'm like, wait a minute. Wow. So you get fired for not showing enough failure. He's like, yeah. Because they know the problems you've been funded to solve are not easy problems. You're not going to hit it on the first time. But if you can go back to them and say, we ran this experiment. Here's what we found. It wasn't our result. But because of this, we're going to run this experiment and then this one and then this one and show them the series of the thought progression. I was like, oh, interesting. He's like, oh, yeah, they'll give you enough money. And then that's, the money's never an issue. He's like, but if you don't show them that you're running experiments, to them, they're like, they're just wasting their time because you'll never think through it in your head. And even if you did, the first question is, where's your experimental data? We want to see what you actually found. So I thought that was like super fascinating. I was like, oh, that's so cool. <laughs> yeah, actually, it's funny. I was yesterday, I was meeting with Dr. Amy Cruz, who was, she was a program director for cognitive neuroscience at DARPA. Oh, wow. And yeah, yeah. We're, <laughs> she's actually taking over a company called Satori Neuro. And I'm on the advisory board for it. So we spent yesterday brainstorming and going through things about cognitive neuroscience and what we're doing and what we're going to do and what position to get in the market and how we can help people and what sort of drugs and psychedelics and supplements and sorts of things we can do and hardware we could position and come up with. And she's great because she was at DARPA for a long time and is the program director there. Same sort of thing. She asks a lot of really great questions. Very smart woman, very keen and super hilarious too. Actually, that's one of the things I really enjoyed about Amy is she's got a very good sense of humor, but I can see that because when you are trying to solve different sorts of problems, you're going to fail. That's it's, uh, it's kind of like baseball, right? If you hit 300, it, you're going to be in the hall of fame. And yeah. that means you failed seven out of 10 times. And that's, and those guys check statistics, right? So it means you're great if you're only failing seven out of 10 times, and it, which is funny if you think about it. I think the academic framework that we always force kids to go through is ridiculous because everything is so geared towards making an A, right? You want to perform really well. That's great. But at what point do you want to fail, right? Like, where do you push yourself to your limits and fail? If you look at athletics, that's entirely different, right? You want people to push themselves to the very edge of the envelope. It's not that they're winning at everything. They literally, you're going to failure, right? You don't work to a comfortable norm where you're going to succeed with every rep. You're trying to get to the point where you cap yourself out. That's why we grow and evolve and become stronger. And it's just funny that we isolate the athletic component and the physicality so much from how we approach the psychology and the mentality. I think if those two things were a little closer, we might be making strides a lot more rapidly than we are. But the whole system isn't really structured in a way that's conducive towards pushing the species forward and kind of evolutionarily advancing ourselves. It's not to get ex esoteric about it, but things are really geared towards the incumbent people or companies that have the resources holding on and locking constructs in for a period of time so that they can better themselves, typically in a financial sense, as opposed to looking at it as a collective and saying, is this the best thing for humanity as a whole? I think if people pulled back a little bit and assess things from the framework, even for a little while of, is this going to be the best thing for my grandkids or for my grandkids' grandkids? Think about the way that we approach construction or the way that we approach transportation or energy production. We would obviously be doing things in an entirely different fashion than we are now. We're not. We're looking for short-term benefit and a quick yield. The whole way construction is structured in terms of real estate transactions, people are looking for how much profit am I going to get over a set period of time? home is going to sell in seven years. How much can I put in it versus how much can I get back? As opposed to saying, let's look at the life cycle costs. This structure is going to wear out 30 years. This structure is going to last a hundred years. If we put X amount of dollars into it, we can transfer it to our, to our, our heirs in the next two generations. It's just a different way of processing things that would probably have much better results. I was talking to my dad and he's a really brilliant man. And I was asking him about transportation and space travel and different things that I was pondering at the time. 
And I was coming up with some different propulsion systems that were really quite keen. And he said, yeah, this is great, Rupert, but do you really think we need humanity to get off of the planet? Is it really something <laughs> we want? And I started to think about it. I thought, well, that's a viable question. We're not being really judicious stewards of our own <laughs> planet. Maybe getting us out to another planet isn't the best move. Definitively, it does guarantee our survival because there are any sort of number of cataclysmic events that could wipe out humanity as a whole in its totality very quickly, just boop, over. Giant death by giant meteor, death by super volcano. There's all sorts of stuff, but not trying to be the harbinger of doom. Yeah, yeah. This is, it's taken, sorry, it's taken a very dark <laughs> turn. But if you look at it, we really have acted more in a viral capacity than we have in the capacity of stewardship of the planet that's been handed to us. And, you know, I don't know, maybe we don't deserve to be bopping about the, the solar system or the galaxy yet. Maybe to a great extent, though, maybe that's a self-limiting function because we're obviously not there yet. Nobody's doing interstellar travel of which we're aware. So if we worked collectively for the benefit of all of the rest of humanity, maybe somebody would help us along with that. Maybe we would get farther. I think in terms of how often have you bumped into kids that are in underprivileged environments and just had the thought, God, that's that's a really brilliant kid. Some kid will ask a question and you think, that's a real shame you didn't grow up in Cambridge. Like you'd be, oh, yeah. you'd end up, I see that a lot. You go out and you do some outreach or talk to some people. And I, a lot of times I do, I walk away and go, God, those guys were really smart. But they're going to be boxed out from resources that other people have access to. And hence, you'll probably never hear from them. They'll spend the majority of their lives just trying to make ends meet and doing the same doldrum run that most of us do all the time. Time to make the donuts kind of a thing. And it's, I don't know, maybe it is a self-limiting function. I don't know. Do you think part of that may be related to cognition that humans tend to be very individual survival orientated and therefore their time span is thinking about most of their life maybe as i'm just getting older i tend to think of things in terms of my lifetime not one or two lifetimes after me not that i'm trying to not think about it it just seems like that appears to be my own default for some reason yeah i think we're i think we're taught to be very self-focused. I don't know that societies as a whole can't function if you're entirely self-focused, but the individual members of them have to be to a certain extent. The whole structure that we have is, it's a primate structure, right? It's hierarchical and there are lots of Indians, very few chiefs kind of a thing. And that's, I don't know, that I wonder sometimes if that's very much biologically driven, but I also hope that maybe we can bypass that. I do actually think that we, as a species, we have survival instincts. The eyes are in the front of our head, which means that we have to have evolved with certain criteria. We have to be predators in a sense, which means that we have to go out and provide for ourselves by virtue of taking or capturing or utilizing or killing or doing something else with other things. I don't know. I guess I just hope and maybe this is me just waxing poetic and wishing better for everybody else. But I just think that if we could be a little more broad in our approach, maybe we'd be more beneficial to everybody else. I think the people that you love the most in the world, there's not much you wouldn't do for them. I think if you extrapolate that and treated everyone with the same approach, the world would be a really remarkably cool place. If you viewed everybody as somebody you love, holy cow, think about how that would be. If everybody that you came into contact with treated you like you were the person that they loved the most in the world, we would be functioning with an entirely different paradigm. I'm, I guess, actually, I should probably lead by example and, and do that. Of course, it's I may need to change my attire and start dressing like Willy Wonka because I would, <laughs> I'm sure I will be radically and rapidly ostracized for doing that, though. You had mentioned cognition, even the use of a psychedelics. If I mean, I did a couple ayahuasca ceremonies like two, three years ago now. One, well, actually, one was a year ago, then one was two years ago. And it was the oddest experience to be lying there in the middle of the ceremony and hearing people throwing up, screaming, crying, like stuff that you would normally hear and think, oh my God, what's happening to that person? But you knew the set and setting, you knew that they were safe, everybody opted into it, nobody forced them into it. And also, I remember lying there thinking, I'm like, ah, oh, 
that's so good. Like you do that. Like you're, I was like, so proud of everyone who was there, who opted in to do something very difficult, especially not knowing how it would be. And when I was done, it was a very interesting sense of empathy and more caring for other people. Maybe part of that is obviously because of the DMT, obviously the drugs themselves, but I think also the environment of people opting in to do something that was difficult that I think also gave me, I don't want to say more faith in humanity, but it also made me realize that, oh yeah, there's still a lot of people out there who are not just in it for themselves. They are trying to be better humans, but they're trying to be better humans so they can serve other people in different capacities too. I think that's actually very true. There are, there are people out there. Luckily, I bump into people every day that have really beliefs towards other people and they do want to help people. I was literally just meeting with the CEO of Higher Dose an hour ago. And she, Lauren, really is driven to help people. It was compelling, actually. It was it was really great. It is. Like you said, it, it makes you have a sort of reverence and a hope about humanity where you're like, ah, that's awesome. Somebody wants to make things better. Sweet. But it, it's not every day that I see that. Like, you know, I was in a normal setting. It wasn't some sort of altered state. But... I think around altered states like that, you do see a dissolution of ego a lot of times. Yeah. And I've done combo ceremonies. I, I haven't yeah. actually done an ayahuasca ceremony, but I've done a lot of combo ceremonies. And those, it's the same thing. Like people are very physically uncomfortable. Yeah. And combo's not you, fun. <laughs> no, it's pretty harsh. <laughs> and you can see them releasing a lot of things, both physically and psychologically. And it's, it's refreshing though, but everyone, when they're done, you look around and every time I've done it, and I've done it quite a few times, every time I've done it, there is also this esprit de corps where people have come mm -hmm. together, you feel closer to those people because you've shared something that's intimate in a sense. And it's not, it doesn't even have to be overt. It's not like you're telling them your deepest, darkest secrets, but it's very much, you've been exposed and open and you're in a compromised position so that definitely weaker <laughs> because you're generally speaking doubled over throwing up feeling a, a tremendous amount of pain flop sweating it's you are in a compromised position biologically and a lot of times emotionally i've seen tons of people crying and oh, yeah. same thing it's it really does it it brings all those things out but at the end of it even if no one said a word everyone does have this kind of from my perspective feeling of being closer to me i always feel more connected to whatever group that i've done that with i actually did that with most everybody at my company because it's i think those things are beneficial right if you're going to spend a lot of time working with people in a close environment in my case i probably spend more time around the guys that i work with and the guys in the lab than i do with my kids and that's i'm sure my kids probably would not want to spend 12 hours a day with me anyway <laughs> it's it, at least not the teenagers they definitely would want to spend more than 12 hours a day with me it's you want to have those relationships where things do feel close and loving and you're compelled to take care of people and help people and those situations put you in that space or at least for me they do i think a lot of that like you said could be because you're having these dmt releases and things like that but I don't know that it really matters what the impetus for it is. At the end of the day, the fact that you feel that way and you feel more kind and loving towards another creature, it's worth its weight in gold. Especially, like I said, with people that you plan to spend a lot of time with and the people you work with. I don't think you're going to see a lot of Wall Street firms having ayahuasca retreats and, no. and doing things together. <laughs> but it it might be a very different world if they did. Yeah. Did you... I've done like combo twice and this happened to some other people in our group too, that I remember the first time I didn't know what to expect. So we did combo in the morning. We did the, the ayahuasca, the DMT that evening. So we had this beautiful time in Costa Rica in between, and I knew about it ahead of time. So I didn't want any outside influence to bring my phone, anything else. And I brought my little journal and I'm like, ah, I'm just going to write down all these thoughts. I'll have so much time relaxing out in the jungle. I didn't write a single thing down for 10 hours. It was so weird. And then the next time I did it the following year, the same thing happened. It didn't feel like my brain was dulled. I didn't feel dulled in any capacity. It just felt like super calm. And it was like normal just to not have many thoughts. And it felt okay. I don't know if you had a similar experience or if it was just me. And I just thought that was just really 
bizarre, but in a good way. I may not be the best person to ask for that or that question because I've spent about 30 years being a diehard meditator. Yeah. That it definitely changes how your brain functions, what you're doing, how you're sure. processing. And personally, I think that's actually a good thing. I'm very pleased with the absence of noise in my brain. I, I think it's actually conducive to a lot of the things I do that my brain is, for all intents and purposes, very quiet comparatively. It's a, it's more of a solid state function than a dynamic function. Oops, excuse me. What type of meditation do you do? Nowadays. Oh, I think you you hit the mute button there, so unmute. Oh, there we go. Sorry, I flipped off no the screen for a second. Uh, right. Nowadays, it's uh, a varied version of like transcendental meditation. And I've studied, I've done a ton of comparative religion and different theology and all sorts of stuff, kind of in the process of trying to figure out what I was trying to figure out at that time. And most religions seem to point back in the same direction. Basically, sit down, be quiet focus, open up, breathe, and things will happen. And that was actually my experience. If things started to happen, I remember trying to do that sort of stuff 30 years ago before I really knew what I was doing and had any instruction in it. And I just, I was very frustrated because I just felt like I was sitting down with my eyes closed and it was somewhat <laughs> annoying. But then I got a mantra. And the, the reason I like the idea of mantra meditation is because that repetitive process of using a sound that you don't necessarily ascribe some sort of cognitive bias to it's a word that i'm familiar with will you attach something to that mm -hmm. if it's just a sound or a vibration or a syllable that you have no ascription of any meaning to it's much easier to just let that kind of go and propagate and then what happens is your mind at some point just disappears and then it will come back and you'll find yourself thinking about something and you try not to be very frustrated by that, which early on, this is why I think most people probably stop meditating is they get annoyed by the fact that they're like, I'm doing it wrong. Oh, I'm yeah. having thoughts. I still oh, have so those they, thoughts all the time meditating. <laughs> yeah, and that's the thing is the reality is it's like clouds on a sunny day. I mean, yep. the clouds are going to move by. Just let them roll. You yep. know, kind of do your thing. Don't worry about it. It's more important that you do the process because I think what happens is it's that space between the thoughts where your consciousness dips out and you go into a place where you're not thinking anymore. And, it, and if you're doing it consistently, what you actually start to find, or at least in my experience and the experience of quite a lot of other people I know is at certain points, your breathing stops, which is why I, I didn't actually give a tremendous amount of credence to the idea of like solely doing breathwork meditation is if you do it right, you stop breathing and then your system reboots. If you really do it right, your heart stops, your brain waves stop, your breathing stops, you are effectively in stasis for periods of time, and then you reboot and come back up. And that's really, if you can zero out an EEG, you're doing it right. That's when your brain is actually in a state where it's truly getting rest because you're not having any evoked potentials express themselves, right? And so you really are truly giving yourself a mental break. But that's those sorts of states, m most people are probably not going to arrive at that point for quite a while because it takes consistent practice. And it's not like you have to be some special anything. It's a state that's accessible to everybody. The only thing you really need to do is consistently do it, right? If you do that twice a day, every day, consistently for a couple of decades, you're going to have experiences. Things will be different. You will shift into transcendental states. It's pretty much a given. So mine is a variation of that. I have a specific mantra and I was given said mantra by the typical person wearing classical, traditional Indian garb and that sort of stuff. And, but don't know what those syllables mean. That's great. <laughs> fine. Don't have to ascribe anything to it. And I just sit down in a comfortable chair. I don't have to sit in a lotus position. I, it's just, I think really it's more the, the idea of doing it consistently. And for any of the, like the scientists and that are listening to this, if you just objectively forget about all of the mysticism and the, sort of the ritual aspects of it and take the anthropology component out and don't look at the culture, don't look at the, the garb or anything like that. If you just look at the, the studies and the data of what happens when people consistently put themselves in those states, it's remarkable. Mm -hmm. I don't know why it's not taught to little kids in schools everywhere in the world because God bless it, it, the things that happen neurally are transformative. Your neuroplasticity goes up. The amount of your cortex that you're actually engaging and utilizing goes up. People who meditate consistently, their IQ works in, in correlation with their age increasing. Your IQ goes up. 
as opposed to damn near everybody else where it's an inverse in, inverse correlation. The older you get, the slower you get. Yeah. And why wouldn't everybody do that? It's it, it's actually it's probably the most remarkable thing that I've ever been exposed to. And thank God I was actually exposed to it because it was profound for me. And I'm sure, honestly, it'd probably be profound for anybody. I just think most people don't do it. And you also you have to overcome the distractions of generally when you need it the most is when you want to do it the least when you're like ah, <laughs> totally stressed out about something and you're like oh i'm running late i've got to do this thing it, it actually it reminds me of uh, are you familiar with the stephen covey's book the seven habits of highly yeah. effective people yep the seventh habit the sharpening the saw kind of analogy over i can't take time to do that i'm chopping the tree down I, like that's exactly it like when you need to stop put a pin in it pull back and do things rest like that's actually it's that respite that really does things we were discussing this yesterday in terms of cognitive behaviors that are actually very beneficial it's when you take that diffuse focus and you take the walk you're not Mm -hmm. just constantly doing it that's actually when things really transpire that are magical that's when a lot of people get that inspiration that stroke of insider genius it's when you're not trying to hammer it down as much as you can it's when you actually let your mind breathe and become expansive and let your subconscious engage and take all of the data that you've amassed consciously, process it, come up with some aggregate resultant thing, and then push it up to your conscious mind. Those are the strokes of, the, those truly are those eureka moments. <clears throat> and I would hope that everybody would just do that, but it's not something that we culturally push and it's not something that's taught in schools. I taught all of my kids to meditate. And I think of the four, two still consistently do it. Hmm. One somewhat consistently and one very consistently. And I don't know that he talks about it a lot, but the kid's brilliant. And he just got a full ride scholarship to school. And he's just, it was a couple of years ahead in mathematics. And not saying that that's the only reason, but it definitively helps. So just the giving your brain a bit of respite. If you thought about it across any other field of endeavor, like, If you trained as an athlete seven days a week, six hours a day, you'd be horrible, right? Your muscles have to have some sort of time when they can recover. If you never gave them a point to recover, what would you expect? I think we're the same, but we don't do that. We just expect that, ah, that thing can just keep going all the time. We're just going to push it and keep squeezing it harder and harder. And that's preposterous, right? You've got to give it the tools that it needs. One of the things is oxygen. We live in an environment where the oxygen in our atmosphere is literally 10% lower than it was when our bodies evolved to be what they are now. We are built, we are creatures that are built to consume 21% oxygen. There's 19% in the air right now. We're running at a 10% deficit. That's not so good. And it's actually, that's, I've been sucking down this stuff that we make in my lab and we all drink it. It's, we call it wizard water. (laughs) <laughs> but it's hyper oxygenated water. So you drink this and your pulse ox goes to a hundred or, really? or your pulse. Yeah. Or your pulse goes down. It's one of the two things. What your body's always looking for some sort of homeostatic balance. So whatever right. is the most Sufficiency. effective. Yeah, exactly. So it's either it decreases the load and that expresses as a reduced heart rate or it decreases the load and it expresses as your VO2 max and your pulse ox going up. And, but it makes a difference, right? Your brain is on fire and you can just keep cruising. But again, I'm compensating for a deficiency in the environment that's inherent. Every time you walk outside, every time you walk inside, the environment is this, the atmosphere is a collective thing. The air we're breathing here is no different than the air that's being taken in China right now. It's all 10% lower than it should be for human physiology. And actually, it's funny, a lot of the things that I've been working on lately focus around that, like compensating for deficits in oxygenation, compensating for overages in deuterium. Like we're all exposed to way the hell too much deuterium in our environment right now. And that those are things that our bodies were built around the concept of having a consistent level of deuterium at about 130-ish parts per million. Now it's upwards of 150 in our environment. That instantly means you've got a decrease in in mitochondrial potential so your metabolic flexibility goes down it's just and that's those are the things that are the as my dad used to always say the cosmic triggers the things that have been 
pulled at some point that's acting on us that we are unaware of and that we don't even know to compensate for. And so a lot of those things, that's where I've been focusing is like, what can I do <clears throat> to help that is going to really benefit things and move the needle that people may or may not even be thinking about. Like deuterium depleted water is great, but it's stupidly expensive. Myself and one other chemical engineer that I'm working with, we came up with, well, actually, we came up with three different ways to make deuterium depleted water that would be cheap enough so that we could sell it at a price that would be the equivalent price of just normal water. And because I always tell people when I hear people say, oh, I've got cancer, the first thing I tell them is get on a ketogenic diet. Second thing I tell them is drink deuterium depleted water because there are a litany of studies about the beneficial effects of both. But I always feel guilty telling them the second one, like keto diet, that's easy. Anybody can adapt to it because it's relatively cheap and commonplace. Deuterium depleted water is stupidly expensive because the process to make it, they use a like a Peltier tally, tower cooling method kind of a thing. It's really expensive. And if you're going to drink just deuterium depleted water for a month, you're going to spend a couple hundred bucks, which is outlandish in my opinion. So that was something that needed to be fixed. So we fixed it. And so I'll start getting that out. And it's just, it's looking for those little spaces where we can kind of make a difference. And that leads me to, as we wrap up here, like the wizard science, which is your whole brand of supplements is where <laughs> I first heard about you through my buddy, Ben Pakulski. And I remember listening oh, to the podcast right on. with Ben and he's a good buddy. I love Ben. He's so awesome. And I texted him and I said, Hey Ben, I just listened to your podcast with this Ian guy. Like, I don't know, man, this guy is either a wackadoo or a genius. And I'm like, I think he's a genius. And so Ben <laughs> writes back, he goes, oh yeah, that guy's a legit genius. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Good to know I ended up on the right side of the coin toss. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> As tested and verified numerically. Yeah, yeah. but again, if, if you're going to hold up, and I wouldn't do that about myself, but if you are going to end up in that category, yeah, a lot of times you are. You're going to seem like a total wackadoo because the things that you're going to be looking at are probably different than what the average person is going to be looking at and that as a term that's something that's used to define by definition something that is outside of the normal parameters right like it means if there are 50 black black suits there's one in bright white <laughs> yeah it may not make you popular <laughs> yeah because the humans are drawn to the extremes and what's not in the norm so in that example the first thing you're going to notice is the one that doesn't match everything else and yeah, that's like what your brain is like literally drawn to for better or worse. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's why I generally walk around humming the Sesame Street. One of these things is not <laughs> just precede in my environment, the concept that people should be okay with the fact that I'm very different. Yeah, I actually Ben Pakulski is great. I love the way he approaches fitness and I very much he's really insightful and the things that he does to break things down in terms of purveying the idea of everybody can do this thing. Here's how you do it. I it's insightful. I think he makes a big difference and hits a big, fat, wide swath of the audience too, which is good. I think all of us in the health and wellness space, we're trying to do that. It's kind of like doctors. I think most doctors I know are very well intended, at, but they're not up on the latest research because they can't be. They don't have the time. They're spending yeah. their days being like the auto mechanics of the biological world. Ah, well, you need a spin balance here. Take this. It's kind of, it's, that's just the way it is. I, like I, I actually, I was in a really horrific motorcycle wreck like 16 weeks ago. Oh, and wow. Are you, looks yeah, like you're I, doing okay now. Oh, yeah, no, I'm fine. I, at the nine week mark, I was up, got my bill of good health from the orthopedic surgeon. My, my femur actually ended up inside my tibia. So oh. the, femoral condyle, yeah, the femoral condyle actually punched into the tibial condyle. So for those of you who aren't yeah, in the medical space, oh. yeah, upper leg bone, the biggest one punches through lower leg bone and it punched down an inch and it split it six inches down. So it Ooh. was kind of like a, a log splitter for my leg. And I face planted at 65 miles an hour. Oh, so geez. it was yeah, less than thrilling. But when the surgeon came in, the orthopedic surgeon came in and I was in the bed and he said, this is a horrible break. We're going to have to put you back together with pins and plates and screws and put you under general anesthesia and then hit your bones with bone filler and reset everything. And his description, he said, afterwards, you'll be able to see the metal plates on the outside and all this stuff. And I said, God bless, this is barbaric. And I said, I don't think so. So I, I called my staff and said, hey, go buy a hospital bed, bring it to the lab. 
and I had them come pick me up and I got discharged and they came and I couldn't move. So they came and they took me off the gurney on a bed sheet, literally like a wounded dolphin <laughs> and slid me into the back of a truck, drove me to my laboratory and then put me on a hospital bed. And then I started doing pulsed electromagnetic field work lasers, stem cells, red light panels, hyperoxygenated water because I couldn't get in a hyperbaric chamber, doing all these different modalities. And I was up, I think 11 days later, I was up and about. I wow. actually, I was, doing a, I was doing a meeting in the lab and I was on with Todd, one of the fellows that I work with. And he was like, what are you doing up? How are you up? And it was just because I'm practicing what I preach, right? This is the latest and greatest stuff that we have access to. There's really it's reprehensible that people are taking as long as they are in orthopedics to repair a bone, right? There's no reason for that. If you use pulsed electromagnetic fields, they repair very rapidly, right? You can repair a really bad fracture in under two weeks, pretty much across the board. Like you, you see very definitive radiographic shifts in a very brief period of time. I think um, that's because bone is also mainly piezoelectric, correct? Yeah, like, exactly. And that's and so, a mechanism. Yeah, so you can actually stimulate it multiple ways, right? You can do it with sonic sorts of things. So as long as you're getting, because it's piezoelectric, you can get things that are vibratory, right? So you can sonicate it, or not sonicate in the traditional laboratory sense, but you can move it with sonic vibration. So you can use sound, you can do it electrically, or you can do it electromagnetically. And all of those modalities trigger a, trigger a healing response where you get these osteoblastic formations and things are starting to pump out and you're getting more trabeculae and everything's starting to mend. And that's, it's just a shame that people aren't exposed to that. When I went back to the orthopedic surgeon, he literally after one week, I had radiographic healing showing new bone and hmm. actually had to argue to be able to get an x-ray because he said, nothing's <laughs> going to show up for three yeah, weeks. Yeah. That doesn't happen. And he actually, after I got the x-rays, he came back with his iPad and he said, do you see that? That's a new bone. And was perplexed, but it's the tech is out there. It's it's not some big super secret black box thing. I mean, everybody that's in the space for electromagnetic field work knows that's the case, right? It's just guys who are on the front lines trying to do the work of healing the masses. They don't have the time to go back and look at what the latest and greatest thing is. And it's also it's not something that's monetarily viable. I think because. The, you know, the companies that are doing that aren't these huge, giant conglomerate pharma international companies. It's not big pharma. Yeah, I don't know about you. I've seen a lot of big pharma stuff. I haven't ever seen big magnet. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so wow, those guys, they're just trying to get in for big magnet. And it's because it's not something that they're going to sell as a consumable over and over, but it's very effective. The same thing with stem cells. That's that's an untapped field. And I think it would be incredibly beneficial for so many people across so many different, so many different ailments that you can be in with. I was talking to a friend of mine who's one of the top stem cell guys in the country. And this was a couple of years ago when the FDA had just passed a ruling that said, if you expand the culture to over 25,000 stem right, cells, limit then on it's it. going to be, yeah, it's going to be classed as a drug and drug. the doctors will get paid because it's an unlicensed drug. And I said, Matt, why in the world would they do that? It's so beneficial. And he said, yeah, that's exactly why. Because mm -hmm. Big Pharma has pushed them into a corner and said, this is healing people. We don't want that. And it sounds a tinfoil haddish, but that really is the reality is those things are all driven by economics. They're not driven by what is going to heal people the most effectively. How can we get the populace in the best possible health? That doesn't generally enter into the equation. It's really what can put the most money into corporate profits and return shareholder equity. That's how things are governed or governed. And for better or worse, I guess that's just where we're at. Yeah, no, that, that's fascinating. And I did some, I've met with the guys who do pulse centers before, and I've done some of the, I've got a EM unit under my bed that a guy sent me, had probably 12 years ago from the earth pulse. And he's quite the interesting character. And I'm just, at first I'm just like, I don't know, this isn't going to do anything. And it was interesting after I used it for probably 90 days, like my max strength didn't go up, but what was weird is that my cardiovascular stuff, I didn't do hardly any cardiovascular training at that point. And normally it drops off after a few weeks, like it didn't drop off at all. All my rep tests I did, all my cardiovascular tests I did stayed the same. And some of them got even a little bit better. I was like, what? That's weird. And so it's, again, 
back to the physics and all those areas, like you can explain what's going on. But if you look at a lot of the research in that area, they're just, there's some for sure, but there isn't as much as you would expect to, to find in those areas. Yeah, probably because economically it's not something that's right. who's going to benefit, afraid. who's going to pay for it. Right. Yeah. Because I've seen things you know, like if you put somebody on, because I actually used a pulse center coil when I was rehabbing myself. And it, if you look at somebody who's got say microvascular coagulopathy, right. Where the little peripheral vascular vasculature is clogged up and things are clumping. We, you can eliminate those clotting factors damn near instantly. If you just put them on a pimp mat. Hmm. and o- open things up and really benefit it. it, it the same thing with the Leela quantum stuff. We very demonstrably showed that that will take clotting factors and roll that back a bit. And those things are great. But again, both myself and Philip with Leela, we're really hell bent on proving things, having the data and being able to put up the data set and say, here, look, it's right there, double blinded, sham controlled, we did it. Because I think that's important, but there's not, Again, there's actually it's a financial detriment for a smaller group. But I applaud the fact that Philip puts the bill for that kind of stuff because for smaller companies, it's really difficult to do that, right? Yeah. I'm I'm lucky because I have access to lots of researchers that I know and that are personal friends and a lot of doctors that I work with and we'll help one another out to do studies and trials and, and assess things and say, does this work? Does this not work? Case in point, the one that just failed with the EDA, the EDTA and the heparin and the sodium citrate, that was because I'm able to go to a clinic and have a doctor that I know and trust actually run these experiments and test them. If I were doing research organization stuff and going out and paying a quarter of a million bucks to have this whole host of experimentation done, I wouldn't be able to do that. Luckily, friends that I trust that will do the experiment in case in point say, sorry, Bubba, experiment failed. It was an abject failure, did not do a damn thing. But then they'll go, eh, come back, we'll try it again. And normally, if you were hiring out a CRO to do that, you'd be spending a lot and it would take a lot of time and if it's not financially viable, it's just not going to happen. Nobody's going to pay for that research. I actually, one of the things in academia that I've seen a lot of times is there was a research group and uh, it was a joint research team between Japan and, and Germany maybe seven or eight years ago that was working on a nanoparticle thing like with fullerenes, like I, I work with a lot. And they were doing brilliant research. Like it was fan freaking tastic. And they were right on the crux of cracking the code on some on- oncology work that would have been revolutionary. But then the research just went cold and it hmm. went cold because they moved on. They lost the grant funding and the postdoc split and everything shut down. It was just, it was sad, but without the, without a NIH grant or something like that behind it, the guys in the lab don't have the money. They're not going to pay for it out of pocket. And so academically, that stuff just goes away. And that quite frequently, you know, things ramp up and they're moving in a really great pattern. They're going to do something that's revolutionary. Grant funding dries up. It's done. And nobody picks up the ball and runs with it of their own accord. And that's just, again, if you want to understand it, sadly, follow the money. And that applies to the health and wellness space. It applies to academia. It's a societal thing, I think, it just across the entire civilization really that's what drives a lot of this i wish it weren't exactly that way but that's the system we're playing in yeah and especially in the supplement world a buddy of mine ran a supplement company for many years he doesn't have it anymore but he paid two hundred thirty thousand dollars to do pretty legit study double blind all the nice things had a big university do it had people helping with the data all all the good stuff and eh, it was almost statistically significant Right. He went back to them and they're like, Hey man, give us another hundred grand. We can add more people to it. We can expand it, but it may turn out to be positive. So he published the data and everything like that and realized that nah, nobody really cared. Like none of the customers were really asking to see any data. He did it because he's like, I believe this is the right thing. I want to know if our product actually works or not. And then after years after he ended up selling the company, he's just sadly, he's like, I would have made a lot more sales if I put that money into marketing instead of putting it into research. And the reality is, unfortunately, he's true. (laughs) correct. No, that's entirely true. And I'm probably horrible about that. I'm sure my company would probably do far better if I pushed marketing and stuff like that. But the wizard sciences thing for me, it's a a passion play in a sense because I'm making things that solve very specific problems 
and help people that I wasn't able to find out there. Like the Neural RX, that was designed to help people with Alzheimer's. And so tell us it, about that it, if people aren't familiar with it. So it's basically, it's a combination of a lipid and a nanoparticle bound together to form a thing called a lipofullerene. So you take a lipid, you bind it to this spherical form of carbon so that it can move through a cell membrane. In and of itself, it's hydrophilic or rather hydrophobic. So it, it's not going to move through the membrane. When you bind it to a lipid, because it's lipophilic, it will actually move through a cell membrane. And then when that happens, there's a swap at the surface of the membrane. It delocalizes from the lipid and then finds its way because of a charge gradient differential to the surface of the mitochondria. And it generally sticks in the mitochondrial membrane on the surface where it begins to act as an oxidative stress buffer. So it knocks mm. out the oxidative stress load inside the cell. And then the net effect of that is you get a somewhere between, we tested on the low end, 18%, on the high end, 583 percent of a boost in the ATP output. That's huge. Yeah, it's enormous. That's like crazy right? huge. And it's funny, on the note of that, you do that, the neural it has all of these components that go in and bring it up to the brain and use the liver diffractionated to beta hydroxybutyrate so the ketone bodies can move yep. to the brain. And then there's a deposition around the neurons. And it triggers these interesting responses where it outpaces BDNF and NGF1, brain-derived neurotrophic factor and neural growth factor 1. So it pumps up the rate of new neurogenesis and because you always have this constant hippocampal neurogenesis going on, but it, it accelerates the rate of that. And so for people who have cognitive deficits, you'll want that. You want new right. neurons to replace the ones that are dinged up. And but unfortunately, your body goes through this process called synaptic pruning, where it generally, even though you're pumping out new neurons at a faster rate, they're very resource consumptive. Your brain accounts for 3% of your body mass, maybe. It's two and a half to three percent, but it accounts for 20 to 25 percent of your oxygen consumption. So it's in terms of resources, there's a huge resource allocation for things neuronally. So you your body goes up oh, too much. Sorry, kill them. Unless you are at a very large cognitive deficit and it's clinging on to them to hold on for dear life or you're putting them under cognitive load, trying to learn some very different new thing, in which case it actually cements the neurons in place and you get the net benefit of getting to use them over time as you get a higher and higher density and more of them in terms of just an aggregate number. But so those things pump up your neurons, but I have the same thing happening with the Olympic formula that we make, but it gets it through most of your skeletal muscle. And so there are all these CrossFit athletes that are using it now, like the top guys in the world, because they started using it when they saw the output numbers, because those guys meticulously track how much of a benefit they get. They were putting, a, one guy called me and said, I literally put up numbers in terms of the weight that I'm able to move that I've not been able to do for seven years. And wow. I ran faster than I've ever run. And this was one of the guys in, in the CrossFit games and or one of the guys in the CrossFit games. And uh, it, it's interesting because when you look at those kind of jumps in ATP, it's a huge number. Most people don't really care. Like I'll say, oh, 58.3% boost in ATP output at the high end. Yeah, that's like unheard of. <laughs> yeah. It, now, here's the interesting thing. That's just because I'm blocking system loss. What I did with the Neural RX for people with Alzheimer's and cognitive deficits was I figured, okay, if I can block systemic loss and get that much of a jump, what happens if I look at all of the complexes of the ETC, the electron transport chain, mm -hmm. and try and bump up the individual components, right? So I put CoQ10 in, accelerate one, put NAD precursors in and bump that up. So when you get those NAD precursors at the same time that you're blocking system loss and you're adding system gain, then you end up with an even more robust energetic profile. So all sorts of things happen. And then I put in proteolytic enzymes to, to go in and start stripping out tau proteins and beta amyloid plaques and break it down so that the glymphatic system can actually upregulate and use interstitial fluid and cerebrospinal fluid to wash that and purge it. And as those things happen, you take people who are in a negative feedback loop biologically where the system is just getting worse and worse. And every day you start breaking it down until you reach that, reach that tipping point where it becomes a positive feedback loop and it's getting better and better and better. And that's happening in the case of the neural RX, it happens with cognition in the brain. And in the case of the Olympic, it's happening throughout the rest of the body. The, those things are hugely beneficial. So for me, that's a, it's a kind of a passion project because I want to make sure that I'm doing those things to, to help and push things forward. Olympic is Olympic because I was making it for guys who were going out for the Olympics for pole vaulting.
And so it was a bit of a joke to call it the Olympic, but it, I would love to push that. And you're probably right. I would probably be better off if I spent time and dollars doing marketing <laughs> as opposed to nerding out and doing research. But truth be told, that's where I, obviously that's really more my bag is going out and nerding out, doing research and failing a lot and trying to figure out cool new stuff, but as opposed to schlepping things and spending a bazillion dollars on Instagram to do that or Facebook or whatever. I would like to think that growing it organically just by word of mouth and seeing people benefit from it, the testimonials are crazy. People that have a lot of, and I don't want to overtly say the different things that it helps, but if you have cognitive deficits, it's beneficial. And I, I don't want to get lambasted by making medical claims or anything right. like that, but you get shut down very quickly. But I really would like, I in my dream of dreams, lots of people would be exposed to that and they would reap the benefits of that. Because I think if everybody felt stronger, better, had better cognitive capacity, the world would be a much nicer place. Oh yeah, hundred percent. And I think the CrossFit athletes you've done some work with uh, Sam Dancer, I believe, correct? Yeah, I have. Yeah, super wonderful dude. Like just one of the nicest big teddy bear people you'll ever meet in your life. <laughs> That's absolutely true. Yeah, and Sam actually, he was one of the fellows because a bunch of them have done this. Sam was one of the fellows that called me to ask. His first question was, "Is this legal?" Which is a good <laughs> question to ask. <laughs> it's a very good question. Yeah, and he did the research too, and. Despite my saying, yes, it's not on the water, USADA or any of that kind of stuff. He did a deep dive on it to make sure it was all kosher and then started using it and actually cycled back or circled back rather and said, here's what's happening. This is my data. This is what's going on, which was remarkable. And it, But the thing is, for somebody who's in terms of physiologically in the median, you may not notice it. Those guys are like the outliers. It was the yeah. same thing with the Olympic athletes, right? Those guys are doing grip strength test and the pole vaulters were doing maybe 160 pounds and then i put them on the olympic serum and they were all hitting closer to the 200 pound range Oof. in grip strength and one of the guys consistently after a period of weeks he broke the grip strength machine because nice. he was consistently <laughs> over 200 yeah it was great actually alex sent me a text of with a picture of the grip strength machine and he had cracked the handle because he was consistently <laughs> over 200 pounds all the time and, you know, that's, but those guys are the outliers, right? They've pushed, it's like Ben Pikulski, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Ben has, <laughs> we were talking one time and Ben said, a lot of people are worried about me because they think I'm small right now. And I said, how much do you weigh? And he said, 265. Yeah. <laughs> but and we're like, dude, you're solid muscle and you're 265. Why would anybody think you were small? And he said, because I was 315 when I was at the peak of my competition, I thought, Oh my God, like 4% body fat, 315 pounds. And then I, because we had talked on the phone a lot, but I had never actually seen a picture. So I Googled a picture of it and thought, oh, okay, I get it. Right. You're like, you're a beast. You're like solid muscle and completely ripped and 315 pounds at just a couple percentage body fat. Yeah, that's different. But it, it was very funny. But those guys, they are, they're like the very extreme edge, but those guys, they notice the changes first because they're right at the edge. So if you can take somebody who's doing 160 pound grip strength, which is already at the very top end of what most people would ever be able to do. And they were expecting two to 3% jumps, maybe, maybe, maybe actually sometimes 1% jumps. And then they're getting 13 to 17% gains and their force output, they were blown away. I was blown away. Honestly, I did, it was like a, oh, wow, who knew? But that's the kind of stuff like I, I want that out there. I would love it for more people to have access to that. But right now I'm trying to figure out how to shift the manufacture of carbon 60 so that I can reduce the cost so I can get it out more ubiquitously to get it to everybody. Um, because right now, I mean, it's exceedingly expensive per gram to get that stuff. And it's going to be prohibitive. It's not something you're going to find on the shelf at Walmart anytime soon, because it's just the average person won't be able to do that. But for people who are at the extreme edge of performance, either cognitively or physically, well worth the expenditure because they're going to see the benefits of it. And would the NeuroRx be useful for also for strength sports? Because a lot of strength adaptations, especially lower rep stuff, is more neurologically based, which I know is an over assumption, but yeah, the neuromuscular component of it. Yes. I would recommend and do recommend actually for competitive athletes that they do both. And depending on what particular endeavor it is that they might bias it towards one side or the other, but yeah, all of the time I recommend to people do both. I do both and I'm 
by far and away cognitively pushing myself more than I am physically. Although in the past couple of months, I do actually, I feel kind of at a physical deficit, even though I'm back up to speed and doing fine. I'm, I'm not running. I haven't been working out. I think most of my physical resources have been geared towards just getting back to a baseline. And so now that I'm back to a baseline, I'm going to take the next couple of months and go back and rehabilitate myself biologically so that I can take the same sort of principles of what I know is going to work and amp them up in a, and not get back to zero, but get from zero to a hundred kind of thing. And it, honestly, I'm looking forward to that. I'm excited about it because it's an next like rehabilitating myself from being utterly broken. That was the first part of the proof is in the pudding. The next part will be like taking myself, rolling some of the biological markers back and rolling others very much forward. I think that'll be the next phase of like showing demonstrably. Yeah. If you do this, you can elicit this sort of response physiologically and benefit this way and that way. And it's good because People can see that if the average person physically, and right now I'm definitively very physically average, I'm not any stunning specimen, can take where you are and push it and benefit from it and end up in a really great place. I think it's it's great to know it's possible. Yeah, awesome. Definitely keep us yeah. updated on that. And Yeah, I will. Yeah, I'm happy to do it. I'd love to circle back and talk again. This is This has been a pleasure, man. I'm glad that we actually got to do this. Yeah, and thank you so much for all your time. I know you're super busy with there's tons of projects you're in that we didn't even talk about yet. But where can people find out more about you and Wizard Science and just all the plethora of stuff you got going on? Go to wizardsciences.com. That's my main website. And hit me up on Instagram at either at Wizard Sciences, they'll route it to me, or at Ian Mitchell one And you can find me there. I'm just a normal guy. And I'm actually surprisingly accessible. I am insanely busy but if people reach out i'll get back to them it may take a bit but i always get back to them wow that's awesome thank you so much again for all your time and highly encourage people to check out all the stuff you have going on there and yeah i'm gonna try some of the wizard science stuff i've used the ozone product and my wife has really liked that for some of the digestive right issues that she's had yeah well i'll give it a whirl and we'll keep you updated on how it goes yeah, please do. I actually, I'm always really curious to see what's helping and how it's helping because the more I know about the way things are benefiting people, when people reach out to me, if I know something, whether it's my stuff or somebody else's, I always try and nudge them in the direction of what's going to help. So yeah, please keep me up to date. Cool. Thank you so much. I really appreciate right, it. Have a wonderful day. I will. Take it easy. See ya. Thank you. Huge thanks to Ian Mitchell for coming on the podcast today. I really appreciate the wide-ranging discussion and all the wonderful things he's doing in the world. I'm super excited to see what comes out of it, especially in the future as we gather more and more data. So huge thanks to him for taking his time out. I know he was running around Austin between meetings to discuss this with us today. As I mentioned in the intro, I've set up a discount with Wizard Sciences. Go to wizardsciences.com forward slash discount forward slash Nelson, N-E-L-S-O-N. That'll save you 15% off a single purchase there. You can do multiple items. I don't believe it works on the subscription. It'll give you a way to test out some of his products there, which I am in the process of doing right now. I don't make any money off of it, but I would love to hear your data and feedback. Either way, whatever you find, I would love to hear it. It's my way of collecting more data. And if you want to hear about everything else that I'm up to, yeah, hop on the newsletter. It's free and go to miketnelson.com. Most of my content now goes out over the exclusive newsletter. I don't ever send or rent your address to anyone else. It only stays with us. So go to MikeTNelson.com, and if you enjoyed this podcast, or if you didn't, give me some feedback. I would love to hear from you, any other guests, anyone else that you would like to see on the podcast or topics, let me know. Thank you so much for listening today. Really appreciate it. If you enjoyed this one, please leave us a review. It just takes a few seconds there on whatever podcast player you're using really helps us out to get more guests and to continue bringing you great free information. Thank you so much for listening. Really appreciate it. Have a wonderful day and we will talk to you all next week.
I have a good mind to go home. If you had a good mind, you wouldn't be here in the first place. <laughs>